things that occurred in the early church was a love feast or an agape feast. You even find them correcting it in 2 Corinthians at times. And, and the church body would come together and they would take of communion and then they would eat together and they would share what God had uh, placed on their hearts and uh, what God had placed on their lives. And maybe a scripture, or maybe a song, or maybe a verse. And I want you to recognize we're going to do that later on and you're going to have that opportunity. We do it in two ways. One is just uh, from me starting it from the front and you guys just being able to share it. I hope some of you will be able to take part in that. And the other is around the table while we eat. It's to just share what God is doing in your life. And I hope that you'll take part in that as we just commune together as the body of Christ. Just pouring it out together. And so we'll be sharing that meal and we'll be hopefully sharing just the blessings of Christ. Well, let's look at the scripture today. We're in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and it's just like God, as we come to these passages, um, it's right in the, the calendar that, uh, that we have set up. Verses 1 uh, through 15, we're going to read today. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up into rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since we had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here's my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much. And he who gathered little did not have too little. Let's pray together. <coughs> Father, I'm so thankful for your word. It speaks true to us. And it cuts right to the quick, Father. And Father, we ask today that your anointing spirit will speak to each of us. And that we won't leave here saying, wow, I've heard a good message today. But we will leave here knowing that we've met with you. And so, Father, I ask in Jesus' name today that you will pour out your Spirit on us. <clears throat> pour it out, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. There are a few things that I would think that God wants us to see today, but first I want us to start off with a, a humble realization that when we're really confronted with God's Word, each time we're confronted with God's Word, His Spirit really speaks to us. There's a challenge deep in our soul, and that challenge deep in our soul brings us to the point where we recognize, wow, God is holy. And this life that He has called us to is so over and above anything that we can achieve on our own. That the truth is, trying to achieve it on our own just brings us 
to a point where we recognize failure. But yet our heart is drawn more and more to what God wants in our life and what He's doing in our life. And because of that, we want that miraculous event that He is trying to do in and through us day after day. And this passage here where the, the writer began talking about a, a gift that was coming back to the church in Jerusalem. See, in the church of Jerusalem, there, there were some poor there, and they were evidently very, very poor. But in the midst of that, that poor, the, the church around them, and I say church around them, from all different cities who had no idea really who these people were in Jerusalem, other than the gospel really began to flourish there, began to just give graciously and pour it out back to the church. And in the midst of, of this conversation, we begin to see just a little bit of God's nature in the midst of believers. And I want you to grab hold of this today because I really believe that God just wants to pour it out on us. You see, in verse 1 it says, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of their most severe trial, their overflowing joy, and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. So here in the midst of, of writing to the Corinthian church that was known as a wealthy church, they, they began to picture a church in Macedonia that just began to pour out God's goodness. A, Really just laying it out for them. You know, it's pretty incredible when we begin to think about it. Because there was Macedonia, uh, considered a poor place. Yet they were participating in a supernatural act. Twice in these four verses the term charis is used. And some of you are looking and saying, where's charis? Well, charis is a Greek word means grace. All right? So the first time it's used there in the first verse, it says, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. So God's given out some kind of incredible grace. And then the second time it's used is down in verse 4, where it says, They urgently pleaded. The understanding of pleaded is that they could participate in that grace. That they could really pour it out. So here's the picture that we have from those Macedonian churches that just... Give us an understanding of God's grace. The picture was that, that God shows grace or unearned love towards sinful and unworthy man. That he just pours it out on you and I. That God, in, in his infinite wisdom, said, you know what? I am giving you love. You don't deserve it. You have no right to it. But I'm going to pour out love on you. And I'm just choosing you out of the blue. It's not something that you've done that says, oh, wow, now they need to be loved. But it's just because God in His infinite love just says, I'm pouring it out on my people. And that's what grace is all about. But the incredible thing about grace is that it goes beyond that. Because when it really works in people, when, when the, that church really took hold of it, when the Macedonian church really took hold of it, it became a part of it. And grace wasn't just a word, it was something that they knew. And they began to understand that, you know, I may not be able to, uh, to, to, to describe it fully, you know, God's unmerited favor, how do I describe that fully? Or, or God's riches at Christ's expense, how do I explain that? But what I know deep down in my soul is that God loves me and has given to me just without measure. I began to think about that. And, wow. But then something powerful happened. If that isn't miraculous enough, that God could shower His love on us in such a way that each one of us just knows the depth of His love. Each one of us knows deep down the core of our being. And wherever we came from today, whatever was on our mind or whatever's on our heart, that God just, in His infinite way, just spoke clearly to you and said, you know what, I love you. And you experience that father love of God. But it went farther with the Macedonian church. Because not only did they experience it, but it came out in their actions. You see, that grace that was pouring out in them began to work dynamically through them. And it begins to work dynamically through us. 
and being poured out on others. In such a way that the, fir the first few verses here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, they say in, in verse 2 it said that they had a severe trial, this church in Macedonia. They had severe trial, but God had given them grace and God gave them overflowing joy in the midst of a severe trial. That they had extreme poverty, but God gave them rich generosity and just beyond their compare. That the Macedonian believers had discovered that rich love of God in such a way moving in and through them that they just poured it back out and they gave. Now folks, I don't know about you, but that's miraculous. If you come to me and you say, you know what, Craig, I am just in a severe trial. But the truth is, I just have overflowing joy. It's just welling up over me and I can't resist it. It just keeps on going. I think one of two things. The first thing I think is, you know what? This guy's lost it. He's a little crazy. Or the second thing I think is, you know what? The Spirit of God has obviously overwhelmed me. If somebody comes to me and says, you know what, I, I am extremely poor, but I just feel led to give just so graciously and pour it out, you know, so much more powerful. I just, I just want to give it. I think one of two things. I think, you know what, they're either just really lost it, or God has touched them. I had a good friend a few years ago. His name was Jerry. And Jerry was a musician. He was a great bass player. Davey reminds me of him a good bit different, but reminds me of Jerry. When I first met him, he came to know the Lord. Uh, he had hair down to here, you know, back down to his waist. And uh, so the first night, we were going out on visitation, and Jerry said, Craig, can I go with you? I said, come on, Jerry, let's go. And so he, he puts his hair in a ponytail and tucks it down his shirt and said, I just don't want to offend anybody. And I said, wow, what's going on with you, Jerry? Well, Jerry got hurt on a, a job site, and he had fallen and hurt his back, and he couldn't work anymore. And he had gone in, into all this labor laws and all this stuff, and uh, Jerry had was renting this house, and it was, truthfully known, the, um, uh, the, the worst house in the area. Everybody knew it, knew where it sat. It was the worst house in the area. Everybody understood it. It was a wealthy area that we lived in, but it just was... Uh, Poor broken down house. And, and so it came to, to the end of it, and Jerry got into of the job thing, and, and Jerry received this large settlement, a big sum of money. And uh, I was rejoicing with him. We were chatting together, and Jerry, that's great. And he looks at me and said, Craig, you know what? I said, What, Jerry? He said, He said, Craig, I just really believe that God wants me to, to give that money uh, for this particular mission. I looked up, looked around his house. I said, Jerry, you sure? You know, maybe you need to get a new house, or maybe you need to do this, or maybe you need to do that. And Jerry looked at me and said, Craig, if I didn't give this back, I know that I wouldn't be doing what God would have me do. I mean, folks, at that point, I began to just be humble, just to be in his presence. Here's a guy that God's grace had just showered on him in such a way. And he would talk to you and say, you know, I was an alcoholic. I drink so much every day. All I did was drink and play music. But God delivered me from it. And just be overwhelmed at, at his realization that God just loved him so much and plucked him out of that mess and just poured out his goodness on him. Jerry, Jerry just looked and recognized, you know what? God has given me so many good things. And so many great things. How could I want any more? And yet everybody around him was going, you know, I want this new car, and I want this new house, and I want this new this, and I want this new that. And Jerry was going, I just want to be what God wants me to be. And so that grace that God had poured out and through him began to pour out dynamically through him. Began to pour out through money. Began to pour out through music. Began to pour out through testimony and witness. And began to just be one of the most dynamic believers that I have ever been around. As God, His grace just filled him. When I read this picture of the Macedonian church, that's what I see. You know, when it says things like, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, 
and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. But listen to this verse. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And you get this picture of these guys just coming out and saying, you know what, there's this, uh, the, the gifts to Jerusalem, we want to come and give to them. But wait a second, you're poor. You don't understand, but God is welling up in us and we just have to give. You know, sometimes we get to the, the, the stigma that we're poor and we can't give. We even get into a mindset sometimes of, when I get rich, I'll give this and I'll give that. You know, God speaks to that several times here. And in the beginning, we just began to see God's nature, just what His heart is. But then we begin to see our nature. And many of us are already being confronted with this as we are talking about these verses. In verse 5, we begin to see our nature and and uh, the writer says, and they did not do as we expected, talking about the Macedonians, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. And when I first read this, I said, you know, what in the world did they expect? If it's in the opposition of what they were saying this church did, what did they expect? And the truth is, most of us came like I did with Jerry. And, you know, don't do that. You might need to get this and that and this and that. And we begin to have such a worldly mindset, a worldly attitude. And God just drops the bomb on that. You know, when Jesus was speaking, everywhere that he went, when he spoke the Beatitudes, the people were amazed. They were confounded. They were going, surely God is touching our heart. And here in Corinthians, it's the same way. That God just drops, drops his bombshell. You know, we came to him with worldly expectations, knowing that they just had a little... And maybe that they give a little bit back. But here's what these guys did. Here's what they did. They went far beyond their nature because God's Spirit was moving in them. And they gave themselves first to the Lord. God, we're yours. Anything you want to do in our lives, you do it. God, I don't have to have this house. and I don't have to have this car. I don't have to have these things. God, I just want to be yours. God, I give you self. I give myself to you. Then he followed up. And so not only did they give themselves to the Lord, but then they gave themselves to us in keeping with God's will. You know what these guys have done? They had grabbed hold of the simple truth in their spirit, in their mind, in their heart, in their body, in every portion of them. And they grabbed hold of the simple truth of that great commandment. That they needed to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind. And then they needed to love their neighbor as their sin. And when they grabbed hold of that, the Spirit of God began working into them. It began to change every aspect of their life. So that when they came to giving and they recognized that this church in Jerusalem had some needs, they poured it out. They poured it out. Even though it went against all sinful nature, even though it went against everything that sometimes we say we want, they just poured it out. And you know what? That's what God wants in our life. That God has this real desire that our life in Christ be different, be changed. Not just a little shape of what we find in the world, but really a radical difference. In verse 9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. What was God saying in all this? He was saying, you know what? Jesus died for you. He gave up everything so that you, through, to, to you, he became poor so that you in, in that poverty might become rich. What was God saying? He said, guys, I want you to understand something. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. That real life starts with Christ. That it ends with Christ. That Christ is in between. That He's in the middle. That their life becomes Christ. And when that comes true in their life, as it did with the Macedonian churches, then they're free. They're not trapped anymore by this world's things. They, they're free to give it away. You know, so often we're just trapped. We're trapped in a rut that says we do this or we do that because we're wanting to get ahead in the world's things. And we bought what Satan has for us. But you know what? 
God has something better. God has freedom. He has freedom from every aspect and every chain. And most of us say, you know what? I wouldn't look at financial things as a chain, but to some of us it is. To some of us it has become such a God. And God just wants to break that free. He wants us to come to Him and say, you know what? God, I'm going to give everything to you. And I'm going to give everything to my uh, to the people that are around me. And I'm just going to love and I'm going to pour it out. No matter what it is that you ask for, I want you to do. Now, to the Corinthian church, there was hope. They had already started giving. It was obvious that God had already touched them. And they, they were just encouraged, give liberally. Give liberally. And here's the, here's the word that he said to them. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has. Not according to what he does. Not happy. God just looks at his people and says, you know what? Here we are today. and We're at a place where we're bringing a love offering. Where we're giving back to God. Where we're giving very much like that early church did to Jerusalem. We're giving to people that are poorer than we are. And we're giving to people that are struggling and really had difficulty. And we're just ready to give it out. And God just has a, a simple word for you. The simple word is, I want you to have my heart. I want you to give everything to me. And then, whatever your heart is willing to give, give. Whatever I place on your heart, give. Whatever you feel like you need to give, give. And that'll be acceptable. That'll be enough. That'll be okay. I came across an article that I wanted to read today. And uh, this was an article um, about this guy named Keith Taylor, who's a Christian in America. And he had benef benefited from a lot of generosity of other people in different times, and like many of we have, in different ways. Uh, for example, while Keith was attending graduate school in Tennessee, hey, Tennessee, that's where I'm from. His car broke down, <clears throat> and the subsequent repair bill caused him to be short on his rent for that month. But fortunately for, his, for Keith, his boss uh, at his part-time job paid the rent bill, bill in full. It was a gift, not a loan, just paid it in full. Can you imagine? Wouldn't it be a blessing? And one evening in 2002, Keith was reflecting on the kindness of his boss and on the other acts of generosity that had contributed to the happiness and stability in his life. Like many Christians, he decided that he would one day dedicate his life to helping others. He said this in his mind, when I'm really rich, I'm going to start an organization to help the working poor. Maybe some of you have had something like that in your mind, in your heart. If God would just give you that amount that you could really start and really help. But then Keith was seized by, by remarkable thoughts. It occurred to, to me all of a sudden, he says, that no one who had ever helped me had ever been wealthy. They had just been nice. They just had compassion. And that's when Keith became like, unlike many Christians. Because that's when he began to act. He decided he would try to help one person each month get through some kind of financial crisis. And he set aside $350 to get started. Now, some of you used to say, well, oh, goodness, I couldn't come up with that much. But he set up, he decided to set up this amount. And he also set up a very basic website that invited requests for assistance. Now, some of you are going, wow, he's in danger now. Well, here's what happened. But when that site was featured on someone's popular blog, Keith's plans went out the window. He received 1,100 emails the next day. Can you even imagine reading that? Most were from people requesting assistance, but a surprising amount were from people who wanted to help. A short time later, Keith incorporated a nonprofit organization called Modest Needs. The organization's first official grant saved a woman's life. She received money for a mammogram that discovered a tumor and has been gaining steam ever since. 
Now fronted by a popular website, www.modestneeds.org. Look it up. Taylor's organization gave away almost $2.5 million in grants in 2009. He said this. Every day is another miracle. It's beyond my imagination. Guys, how much God want to use you? What has he called you to do that you sat back and said, you know, I don't know if I can do that. What is he saying to you now? Say, you know what? Commit your life to me. Commit your life to others. Pour it out. What does God want from this room? Today, we're on harvest. Thanksgiving service. Love offering. We're going to help the Pakistani appeal. But you know what? It's more than just about us reaching in our pockets today. It's more about you and I saying, God, I'm yours. What do you want to do? I am convinced that when God's people truly say those words, God, I'm yours, then God does miraculous things. Keith started with $350. The truth was, he didn't know where the next month's $350 would come from. And yet, in 2009, 2.5. What is God calling us to be? I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to pray together and then we're going to come to communion. Father, today we come to you and your word just challenges us. And when we open it, sometimes we just think, oh, there's nothing really there for me. But when your spirit begins to talk, then we realize how you speak such truth into our lives. And Father, oftentimes we think, well, I, I really can't do anything. I really don't have much. And yeah, Father, the truth is we have exactly what you've given us, and that is a lot. Father, I pray that today we will be a people who no longer say, but I can't. But we say, but God can. And Father, we follow you just wherever you want to lead us. So hear our prayer, Jesus. Move it up. In Jesus' name we pray.